Introduction There is perhaps no truer and more frequently proven adage than power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. While this casual maxim is tossed around in a variety of situations, it has its roots in reality, and they are continually proven to this day. We put a premium on power in modern society, throughout the world, and although many people in positions of power are there because they rightfully deserve to be, are the best people for the job, and have respect for the laws and policies in place for their respective industries or countries, there are also those that bend the rules for their own gain. This is a nearly unavoidable symptom of human nature. If we see an opportunity to get ahead in the world, even if it is at the expense of others' well-being, some members of our species will take it. In no way does that make it acceptable, and using the it's natural excuse is certainly not admissible in most courts of law. However, bending the rules is often allowed to slip by unnoticed, and has done so for thousands of years. Scraping a bit off the top, working the system, and operating in the grey area of legality are hardly new concepts, and the endless examples make it impossible to constantly police. As soon as laws are made, loopholes are found, and inevitably widened. However, bending the rules and breaking them entirely are two very different things, and when greed and self-assurance grow too strong, or when the fear of getting caught disappears, truly staggering crimes can be perpetrated. The word crime is certainly appropriate, as the gross breach of any established law constitutes a crime. But when these things happen in the world of business, they fall under the more front-page-worthy category of corporate scandals. Scandals come in all shapes and sizes, from sex and drugs to money laundering and murder, and they make for exceptional headlines. Unfortunately, the longer that a series of crimes takes to be exposed, the larger the eventual scandal will be. The size and scope of any scandal depends on the ambition of the criminal behind it and the ability of appropriate authorities, partners, employees, or institutions to identify and prove that criminal conduct has occurred. The fact that certain corporate scandals throughout history have been allowed to get to such an extreme level is evidence of much larger problems, either oversight irresponsibility, inherent corruption within powerful organizations, or a global culture that allows a flexible moral standard or perhaps all of them at once. However, the underlying cultural problems are far beyond the scope of this book. Some insight into the motives and the madness behind these problems is a given, as these stories would hardly be worth telling without a backstory. But analyzing the more intense and comprehensive issues that result in this type of scandal chasing and criminal behavior is simply impossible. Another book, perhaps. While any decent scandal is sure to cause a buzz for a while, and certainly make its rounds in the Twitter sphere and Facebook universe, as well as international news networks and late night talk shows, it takes something particularly juicy to capture our attention for more than a week or two. We're attracted to scandal in the same way that scandalous corporate stars are attracted to money and power. A more cynical writer might call into question the delay in breaking a good story in the hopes that it would become even more entangled and impressive but I'll keep my suspicions to myself as much as possible. What interests me more is how it happens. When does the low-hanging fruit become too hard to bear? How is a much easier question than why, and can usually be deduced by finding the loopholes that allowed such a gross oversight to occur. There are plenty of front-page news scandals every year, but this book will focus on some of the most exciting and unusual scandals of the past half-century. From keeping billions of dollars in debt off the balance sheets to selling millions of dollars of stock only days before a company posts a devastating loss, there is a wide selection of corporate scandals that have truly shocked the world. If you want to break down the worst scandals in history, it becomes a study of measuring the severity of impact. The sum total of money stolen or lost is not the final deciding factor, as that money is often returned or insured somehow. However, when it comes to a scandal's effects on other people, such as thousands of people losing their jobs and livelihoods, most people would argue that those scandals are truly the most damaging and damning. The bottom line is that scandalous behavior is a double-edged sword. It functions as entertainment and newspaper fodder for some, but economic ruin and shattered dreams for others. Corporate scandals are a symptom of our age. 
and they will likely continue to be a part of our collective culture for generations to come. As such, it's important to understand a bit more about these blockbuster lawbreakers, the companies they worked for, the loopholes they found, and, of course, how they eventually got caught. Let's dig a little deeper into some of the most unbelievable and infamous corporate scandals of all time. Chapter 1. Enron. Crash of the Titan. Forbes magazine once crowned Enron as the most innovative company in America. Not once, but six years in a row. And, given its impressive services, products, output and profits, there was little room to argue. In the late 1990s and very early 2000s, Enron was one of the world's most important and respected energy, services and commodities companies. They dealt in natural gas, electricity, pulp and paper services, and communications, and raked in more than $100 billion in revenue in the year 2000. The stockholders were happy, the employees were well compensated, and the company had never been in higher demand. In short, it looked like Enron was going to be the poster child of the global energy sector for many years to come. Oil and natural gas companies have always been associated with massive profits simply because the vast majority of our global population demands electricity, heating, automotive transportation, and other luxuries that can only be achieved through some sort of energy provider. When an energy company posts revenue of $60 billion or $100 billion, the numbers seem too astronomical to fathom, but not criminal in nature. The complex web of companies and partners and interchangeable revenue streams make it extremely challenging for analysts and shareholders to understand the full breadth of the company's holdings. This is true for dozens of multinationals and conglomerate corporations that are still in business today. When Enron's stock price rose more than 300% from the early 1990s to 1998, the country celebrated its energy titan, which was trying to simplify energy, broadband, natural gas and pipeline services to individuals and companies across the country. It had already become the most dominant name in natural gas by 1992, but used that foothold to expand into the entire energy industry, from top to bottom. Following those eight years of impressive stock growth, it exploded in 1999 by more than 50%, and then again in 2000 by nearly 100%. All told, from 1996 to 2000, Enron's value shifted from approximately $13 billion to over $100 billion a wildly unprecedented rate of growth that made it one of the wealthiest and most powerful companies on the planet. The stock market continued to pour praise on Enron, valuing it at more than 70 times its actual earnings and causing the stock to peak at $90.75 by the middle of 2000. Those sorts of stock prices meant billions of dollars in bonuses to top executives and job security. Or so the leadership at Enron thought. As it turned out, the projections and figures that Enron had been claiming for the better part of a decade were not technically true. They had been hiding billions of dollars in losses, keeping them off the accounting books, or falsifying profits and grossly overestimating revenue. This was far from an accidental error in the plus and minus column. The Enron scandal, as it came to be known, had occurred due to a systematic and masterful manipulation of not only Enron's top leadership, but also of a globally renowned audit and accounting firm, Arthur Anderson. Back in 1985, Kenneth Lay formed Enron when two large energy firms were merged. Jeff Skilling had worked as a consultant for Enron in its early years, and was hired in 1990 as chairman and chief executive. This is when the scheme began to play out. Essentially, these two men designed a financial reporting scam that allowed them to take advantage of reporting loopholes special purpose entities, and weak financial reporting oversight to hide billions of dollars in losses. The company was constantly trying to expand into new industries, which meant buying and investing in many companies. By implementing something called market-to-market -market accounting, the company leaders were able to claim projected revenues far into the future for unproven companies and product sales. For example, Enron bought several companies and projected the potential profits for these partners into their revenue statements, even if those companies failed or lost money. These false revenue streams could carry through the books for months or even years 
which resulted in higher declared earnings, increased stock prices, and more money in the pockets of the men at the top. They also used clever revenue reporting methods by adopting a similar liability categorization as trading companies, where they could report the entire value of each trade as revenue, without including statements about the actual products, purchases, cost of goods. This meant that it heavily inflated revenue and hid losses in the ether of accounting, resulting once again in massively overestimated value for the energy titan. They further complicated the situation by protecting themselves against risk from these illicit practices by using tax shelters and special purpose entities to effectively hide or protect their money. Through a number of official company sales and acquisitions, Lay and Skilling were able to hide billions of dollars within other companies technically owned or partnered with Enron in different industries. The list of these sorts of secret maneuverings and deals is shockingly long, and they were largely the reason for Enron's impressive stock growth in the latter half of the 1990s. The SEC became suspicious of the huge growth and began an investigation into the inner workings of Enron. Although the soaring stock prices drew initial attention, it was an internal whistleblower named Sharon Watkins that eventually blew the whole scam out of the water and into the public eye. When the massive overestimation of wealth was revealed, the stock price plummeted from an all-time high of over $90 to an all-time low of less than $1. This caused the almost immediate collapse of the company. Thousands of employees not only lost their jobs, but also their retirement funds. All told, shareholders took a $74 billion hit from the previous king of the energy industry. The pair had been able to pull it off for so long by putting pressure on their audit and accounting firm representatives from Arthur Anderson, one of the largest and most respected accounting firms in the world. When those audit professionals willingly turned a blind eye, they also broke the law, and later investigations essentially took away the company's license to practice causing irreparable damage to its reputation as a global accounting, tax, and consultancy leader of the Big Five. Lay and Skilling were both investigated and found guilty. Kenneth Lay died before he could ever serve time, but Geoffrey Skilling is serving 14 years of a 24-year sentence. Finding those loopholes put Enron on top of the world for half a decade, but it was only a matter of time before the spotlight, which they probably provided the energy for, began revealing that no one gets that big, that fast, without something less than legal going on behind the scenes. Chapter 2. Martha Stewart Living Outside the Law When it comes to home furnishing and do-it-yourself homemaking, Martha Stewart's name is almost inevitably on the tip of your tongue. This American mogul has involved herself in everything from reality television shows and stock brokering, to magazine publications and e-commerce. Her name has become synonymous with a lifestyle, and her magazine, Martha Stewart Living, was one of the most popular and well-respected magazines in mass publication within the United States. Her television show, of the same name, was wildly popular for the better part of a decade, allowing her to share her tips, tricks, and secrets on everything from gardening to cooking to making decorations for the house. However, even the elegant exemplar of domestic bliss couldn't escape the clutches of corporate scandal, and, when all was said and done, one of America's true sweethearts had to stand trial for insider trading charges in one of the most controversial and widely watched scandals in modern history. But that's getting ahead of the story. Let's take a step back to see what really happened. Imclone was a biopharmaceuticals company that specialized in oncological medicines and treatments. One of its major drugs in development at the beginning of the 21st century was Erbitux, a monoclonal antibody that would have been used to seek out and neutralize cancerous cell clones. It was a promising new drug, and the company expected large returns once it had passed the approval phase from the United States FDA, Food and Drug Administration. Unfortunately, near the end of 2001, the FDA decided not to approve the experimental drug. Due to the large amount of money that had been projected from this new drug release, the stock price had inflated. But when news of the drug's rejection hit the stock market, the stock price dropped sharply. This is the sort of risk that stock markets are founded on. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. However, there seemed to be a large sell-off of M-clone stocks in the days leading up to the announcement that the drug had not been approved. 
an investigation by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission revealed that a number of shareholders and executives of the company had sold off large portions of their stock due to this insider knowledge before the news was released to the public. More than $10 million in stock was sold on December the 27th and 28th of 2001, and there is no such thing as a coincidence that large. Simply put, the company's executives and stockholders were engaging in insider trading, which is illegal. The story became far more exciting than the traditional insider trading scandals that so often crop up on Wall Street when it was revealed that Martha Stewart had also held a fair amount of Imclone stock and had also sold her shares, nearly $230,000 worth, on December the 27th, the day before the announcement. Martha Stewart's daughter had once dated Samuel D. Waxall, the founder of Imclone, who had begun telling friends and family to sell their shares once he realized that the company's stock prices were about to plummet. Peter Basanovich, Martha Stewart's broker at Merrill Lynch, had apparently given her non-public information that led her to sell her stocks, and although she claimed innocence, or at least no knowledge of wrongdoing, the actions were suspicious, to say the least. The news came out very quickly, but the legal process is a long one. Martha Stewart, despite her hands having literally been caught in the cookie jar, continued her television show and remained at the head of MSLO, Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia. For nearly two years, scrutiny and tabloid rumors and even on-air interviews about her involvement in the M-Clone scandal swirled around Martha Stewart. But she just continued preparing salads and giving out household tips to millions of people each week. It wasn't until 2003 that she was finally indicted by the government on nine counts, including insider trading and obstruction of justice. During the proceedings it did come out that Stewart's broker had told his assistants to inform Stewart of the events unfolding at Imclone, including the details of the failed FDA approval, at which point Stewart chose to sell her stock and save tens of thousands of dollars in potential losses. She was fined approximately $200,000 and sentenced to five months in prison, followed by five months of house arrest, two years of probation, and a five-year ban from being the CEO, CFO, director, or any other leading executive within her own company that would allow her to disclose, report, audit, or control financial statements. The world watched as one of the most celebrated names in domesticity and homemaking headed into the big house. And Martha Stewart didn't disappoint. She actually took a position within the prison to act as a line of communication between the prison management and the inmates, showing diplomacy, grace, and intelligence even in an orange jumpsuit. Five months later, having paid her debt to society, she dove right back into building her empire. Unlike many other scandal makers who never recover from their illicit activities, Martha Stewart's career, or at least her company, seemed boosted by her incarceration. MSLO expanded into real estate, winemaking, mass-produced craft items, and home furnishings. What had once been a media empire rapidly grew into a sprawling inter-industry giant that showed no sign of slowing down. Martha Stewart has written numerous books since being released in 2005 and has talked candidly about her behavior and subsequent time in jail. As mentioned in the introduction, as a global society, we love to see a scandal unfold and the greedy top dogs of the top finally get what's coming to them. However, in this particular case, we enjoyed watching the scandal but seeing a beloved household name become embroiled in the controversy changed the game entirely. It fascinated the country, and since our collective memory is apparently short, we applauded the criminal and showered her with love. People don't look at Martha Stewart and see a criminal. They see a reformed mogul who lost her way, or at least took a wrong turn. Samuel Waxall, the original distributor of the insider information regarding M. Clone's stock, served more than seven years in prison. I doubt there was a media empire to come back to for Waxal, and that is why the scandal at Imclone is such an interesting point of study. Most people know that Martha Stewart was involved in insider trading, but very few of them would even know the name Imclone, let alone Samuel Waxal. When the glitz and glamour of Hollywood becomes mixed in with the dark underbelly of illegal business, the world is perfectly happy only digging far enough, reading the headlines and remembering the highlights, without ever seeing the whole picture.
Chapter 3. Texaco, the Search for Black Gold. There are few industries that have been around as long and have remained just as profitable as oil. With a current global value of $3.2 trillion for gas and oil, there is clearly a ridiculous amount of money to be made in the industry. As we've already seen so far in this book, when profit margins are that steep, people can get a bit crazy. Back in the mid-1980s, however, companies were acting just as wild as individuals, but the stakes were just as high. In 1984, the head of Getty Oil, Gordon Getty, decided to sell his oil empire to the highest bidder. He spoke to the biggest oil companies he could find, and eventually settled on Pennzoil, and they made an informal yet binding contract. The sale price was to be set at just over $10.53 billion. Later that week, Gordon Getty was approached by representatives from Texaco, a major rival of Pence Oil. He then agreed and confirmed the formal sale of Getty Oil to Texaco, in direct breach of the contract he had entered into with Pence Oil. This sort of last-minute backhanded deal-breaking happens more often than we're ever told, but on such a grand scale and in such a lucrative industry with huge amounts of money at stake and interested parties around the world, this backdoor dealing made front-page headlines from coast to coast and even around the world. $10.5 billion is a lot of money in 2015, but back in 1984 it was unfathomable. Gordon Getty was the wealthiest man in America in 1983, and that was only for a $2 billion fortune. In other words, Pennzoil was losing a massive opportunity, and it had been snatched away from them through double-dealing and intentional malicious deal-making by Texaco. You may see this situation as a too-bad-for-you scenario, but the concept of an informal yet binding contract made the entire affair a legal issue, and Pennzoil had a legitimate case to hold against Texaco for the loss to their company. Breaking contracts, especially on that scale, can be very costly, and, according to Texas law, very illegal. Throughout the lengthy legal process, Pennzoil was calculating all of its potential losses due to the illegal sale, and when the court eventually ruled in favor of Pennzoil, Texaco was facing a massive fine. They had just purchased the company for more than $10.5 billion, and their total amount of damages and legal fees and punitive charges amounted to nearly $13 billion. This was the largest civil suit in American history at that point. Furthermore, to add salt into the wound, the court would not allow for the appeal process to begin until the company paid its bond, which was the full amount of the court's fines in addition to interest. At that point, Texaco had no other choice. It could not afford to pay that type of money and was forced to declare bankruptcy. This was also the largest bankruptcy filing in U.S. history at that point and it caused tremors throughout the financial system and the world. Pennzoil eventually settled with Texaco for $3 billion in damages. Texaco was down, but not out, and the following year they merged with Saudi Aramco, thus beginning a 25-year period of merging and absorptions, disbandings and gradual disappearances. Texaco gas stations have all but disappeared, replaced by Shell and Esso and Conoco, you might still find the occasional Texaco station in the deep south of the United States, but it is a dying brand. However, watching an oil empire slowly crumble after being dealt a single knockout blow more than two decades earlier goes to show that the more money and resources there are in play, the less a scandal actually has to do with righting a wrong. In the case of Texaco, Pennzoil, and Getty Oil, this scandal was more like a hostile takeover gone wrong resulting in Pennzoil bleeding Texaco dry until it had no choice but to give up and declare bankruptcy. People often think about the reputation of a company following a scandal, but in reality, for oil companies, reputation is never going to be the top priority, as they will always have a product that is in demand. However, profits speak louder than reputation in certain industries, and that kind of business can get bloody. When it comes to an industry worth over $3.2 trillion, everyone wants a piece, and they'll do anything they can to get it, even if they have to step on someone else's billion-dollar toes. Chapter 4. Carrion Group. The Rise of Corporate Sleaze. 
While the companies examined so far have certainly had their fair share of dirty players and greed, their crimes have almost entirely been related to money, whether through sneaky deals, insider trading, or clever manipulation of the figures. While there is plenty of that in the scandalous story of Carrion Group, one of Asia's largest conglomerates in the 1980s, the company's story has a much darker side. Murder. It is a sad truth that bumping up that level of intrigue always draws a crowd. But the Carrion Group scandal was one of the largest and most sinister corporate schemes that the world had ever seen. Although the total amount of money that was fraudulently accounted for may not seem like much in terms of today's scandals, the exposed corruption rocked the global media and financial sectors, and the collapse of the Carrion Group in 1983 was the biggest bankruptcy in Hong Kong's history. Before we get into all the details, perhaps we need a bit of exposition. In 1980, a relatively unknown civil engineer named George Tan, who had begun working as a project manager at a land development company, began making risky property acquisitions in Hong Kong. The Carrion Group Limited had been founded back in 1977, but it wasn't until 1980 that their scheme for success was put into motion. Via a 75% subsidiary, Carrion Group purchased Gammon House, which was a prime piece of real estate in the central district of Hong Kong. The purchase was made for nearly 1 billion Hong Kong dollars, and while that figure was staggering back then, the company quickly flipped the property for nearly 1.7 billion Hong Kong dollars. Obviously, this drew significant attention from the financial and commercial markets of the country, as that sort of profit margin in such a short time for a land developer was impressive, to say the least. In less than two years, George Tan was the head of one of the biggest land developers in the country, and the company wasn't satisfied with one major property in Hong Kong. Using the profits from their first major undertaking, Carrion Group found Carrion Investments Limited, which gave the company access to the financial markets. Based on this influx of capital, the Carrion Group was able to expand its real estate and financial empire to include holdings in a wide variety of industries, including transport, catering, hotels, shipping, and real estate, just to name a few. At one point, they even owned the largest taxi company in Hong Kong's history. Those first few years of the 1980s were hugely profitable for the Carrion Group and George Tan, as well as for the supporting banks of the company's financial interests, namely Bumiputra Malaysia Finance and Bank Bumiputra Malaysia Berhad of Malaysia. By engaging in fraudulent reporting, deceit and corruption, Carrion Group was able to manipulate financial markets and essentially trick high-level bankers and auditors into handling the dirty work and providing the company with access to massive amounts of capital. It may be shocking that Carrion Group and George Tan were able to perpetrate such a significant real estate scam in such little time, but they did it by allying with two respected names that had once worked at Price Waterhouse which remains one of the big four accounting and auditing houses in the world. This immediately gave Carrion Group credibility, and by promoting John Marshall, one of the PW hires, to the position of managing director for all major Carrion companies, it seemed as though the huge land developer was above suspicion and above board. That was not the case, and while George Tan and Carrion Group's coffers swelled, debt continued to grow. When an auditor for Bumiputra Bank, Jalil Ibrahim, was found dead in a banana grove outside Hong Kong, questions began to arise, and more people began looking into the questionable business and accounting practices of the Carrion Group. It quickly became apparent that Ibrahim had discovered something in the books of Bumiputra Bank and was going to expose the corruption. A chairman of Bumiputra Malaysia Finance, Lorraine Esme Osman, was suspected of having a hand in ordering the death of the auditor, but nothing was ever proven, despite him being held in detention in London, fighting extradition for seven years. The man arrested for the murder has already served his sentence and is now living out his days in Penang, while Osman and George Tan, perhaps two of the key figures in this massive conspiracy, remain free. This conspiracy took place more than 30 years ago and remained in contention for the better part of two decades but it is still the largest Asian corporate collapse of that era. By implicating major financial institutions across the region, Carrion perpetuated billions of dollars in fraud 
and Bank Bumiputra required a $1 billion recapitalization by the Malaysian government to remain afloat. Shocking enough, despite the blatant fraud and corruption that had been exposed, the Malaysian government did not pursue criminal investigations into any of the government officials or bank leaders who might have been involved in this fraud. This remains a mysterious black hole of a scandal, which is why it remains one of the great shadowy pieces of Hong Kong's history. As more of the key players in this scandal begin to pass away, like Osman in 2011, it will become more and more difficult to determine what really happened back in the early 1980s. Was Jalil Ibrahim supposed to be killed? Were Osman and Tan involved in the planning or ordering of the hit? How much money was actually fraudulently accessed and spent? Who in the Malaysian government was in on the scam? All told, Carrion Group collapsed following the murder and subsequent investigations, and from a once great empire of Hong Kong's economy, only a restaurant, Kariana, remains. This scandal is evidence that in certain parts of the world, when international policies, philosophies, legal codes, and ethical foundations may differ between involved players, corporate scandals can be shockingly hard to prove, fully understand, or prosecute. Chapter 5 Banco Espirito Santo Old Money, New Problems For more than 150 years, the name Espirito Santo has been synonymous with the banking and financial system of Portugal. Banco Espirito Santo and the family behind it, including the famous patriarch nicknamed DDT, Dono Disto Tudo, owner of all this, have had their fingers and interests in every industry from real estate in North America to diamonds in Africa and billions of dollars in corporate and commercial assets in Portugal. The company had been through controversy and tragedy in the past, namely during the nationalization of the country. The Espirito Santo family was torn from power and imprisoned, as they had been one of the primary financial institutions under the dictatorial regime of Antonio Salazar. When that regime was removed from power, the banking family similarly lost its power, but was able to reclaim their empire with international aid and support from some very powerful allies, including the White House. However, this latest round of trouble occurs while the European market is still in a very fragile state. With numerous collapses and recessions still raging around the Eurozone, the revelation that nearly $4 billion in fraudulent debt was being hidden by a titan of the Portuguese banking system is both dangerous and worrisome. There are constant worries of a complete collapse, and given that Portugal was the poorest Western European country that had been struggling with recession and unemployment issues for years, this blow is particularly strong. The question is, how was this allowed to go on for so long? How can one family hide $4 billion in debt from organizations like the IMF and the European Securities and Market Authority? The answer to that is why this story is so interesting. After more than a century of prestige and respect, in which the Espirito Santo clan accumulated a massive fortune that stretched across the globe, they wanted to protect their assets. To that end, they created an outside organization to manage all of the transactions and financial issues the company needed to handle. Eurofin was a privately held Swiss company that dealt with many Espirito Santo entities. In fact, 23% of Eurofin was owned by another family company, Espirito Santo Resources. Basically, this gave the Espirito Santo family quite a bit of control over the operations, or at least influence. That is why, when the rest of Europe was struggling to stay above water during the global financial crisis and the subsequent recessions across the Eurozone, Banco Espirito Santo and the rest of the family's empire was able to remain in good standing. Eurofin was responsible for moving money around the family, and often packaged large amounts of debt from various companies and then sold it back to the bank's clients. This was essentially hiding huge amounts of debt from suffering companies in clever, covert and illegal ways. From the outside looking in, the company was posting enough profits to avoid much suspicion, particularly in its more valuable holdings. But in reality, debt was being shifted around so quickly that regulators and auditors were largely unable to detect the movement. This debt was handled and traded by another Espirito Santo-created entity, 
Tulipa, a trading desk based in Lisbon. This charade continued, and at one point internal memos reported that the Espirito Santo scam could potentially sell off 30 to 40 billion euros annually, if necessary. When suspicions began to rise about the trading practices between Banco Espirito Santo and some of its other family-related companies, following an insider tip, things began to come to light that the family had been hiding for the better part of a decade. When the truth came to light and it was found that Banco Espirito Santo's internal processes were breaching a number of regulations, more than 3.6 billion euros of debt had been sold off, while the companies continued to post profits and deceive investors, the Portuguese stock market and the entire European community. The list of violations that the Espirito Santo family and corporations committed is impressive, including insider trading and accounting fraud. In total, the unravelling of the Espirito Santo scandal led to a nearly 4 billion euro hit to the Portuguese stock market, representing a 22% drop. With the ongoing fragility of the rest of the European community, this sort of major hit to one country that had already been struggling has sent shockwaves throughout other precarious countries. What makes this scandal so serious and devastating is that it was left undiscovered for so long, and while the regional economy appeared to be improving, it has in fact been suffering more than ever imagined. Due to the recent nature of this scandal and the ongoing recovery efforts, the full effects of this scandal are still unknown. One thing is certain, however, the old familiar ties of the Espirito Santo family which included kings and presidents of the past, are not going to be able to save them from financial ruin and international embarrassment. This is the end of a global dynasty, but perhaps the Espirito Santo Empire should have ended with a bit more grace many years ago. Chapter 6. Health South Corporation. Fraud is the best, worst medicine. Although Health South Corporation is meant to help people and is the largest inpatient rehabilitation company in the United States, the scandal that shocked company investors, shareholders, and the broader medical community of the U.S. certainly didn't have taking care of people at the top of its priority list. The company experienced huge success leading up to 2003 when it expanded into every state of the U.S., as well as facilities in half a dozen other countries. With more than 6,000 employees at more than 2,000 locations across the world, HealthSouth was a dominant and well-respected name in the healthcare industry. In fact, it was the most valuable healthcare company in the country. However, the company's stock had actually begun to drop more than seven years earlier, when Richard M. Scrushy took matters into his own hands. He began directing a series of fraudulent activities that stretched on for more than seven years, falsely inflating the price of the stock by reporting up to 4,000% more in earnings than they had in reality gained. At times, the tax that they were required to pay on their inflated earnings was more than the company's true earnings. By manipulating accounting records, Health South's executive leadership was able to maintain the stock price and fulfill investor expectations. When all the thousands of transactions and accounting records were analyzed, it turned out that more than $4.6 billion in fraudulent earnings had been reported. The tipping point came when SEC investigations into Scrushy's timely sale of $100 million in stock preceded a major stock loss for the company. This would have been considered insider trading, but Scrushy managed to be acquitted of those charges. However, as the books began to open, more and more fraudulent earnings reports began to appear. What was at one point $1.4 billion soon grew to $2.9 billion, then $3.5 billion, eventually settling at a whopping $4.6 billion in total fraudulent reports, which had been keeping the company afloat for those seven years, its period of largest growth. What made this scandal particularly tabloid-worthy was the almost insultingly lavish lifestyle that Scrushy was living in those years, which included a 92-foot yacht, millions of dollars in art, and classic cars. All the while, this inpatient rehabilitation center mogul was bankrupting his company by falsifying earnings and putting the welfare of tens of thousands of patients in jeopardy. Scrushy was known as an intimidating and even frightening director, and many employees were afraid to report indiscretions. Similar reports came from accounting directors throughout the company, 
a culture of threats and intimidation that belonged more in a mafia movie than a medical titan. When Scrushy eventually stood trial in 2005, he was acquitted of all 36 counts of fraud, and one of the greatest frauds in the history of the country was nearly complete. In the year following the trial verdict, which shocked the nation and the remaining leadership of the company, every effort was made to eliminate all traces of Scrushy's influence and connection to the company. Four years after that fateful court decision, Scrushy was sued by the Health South investors who had lost millions due to his actions. At the company's peak in March in 1998, the company's stock was worth more than $30. Following the revelations of the fraud and scandal, the price plunged to 11 cents in March of 2004 before climbing back to the $6 range and slowly recovering to this day. This massive drop, however, represented a complete collapse of the financial structure of the company, as the fraudulent accounts represented nearly 20% of the company's value. The investors got some of their revenge, although not nearly as much as many would have wished. Scrushy was ordered to return $2.8 billion to company investors. The company has had to sell off, close, or drastically reduce hundreds of its facilities across the world, and is but a shadow of its former self. What had once been the top earner in an industry worth hundreds of billions of dollars, despite those earnings being largely falsified, is now a serious warning to other companies about how the impact of accounting inconsistencies can cause major problems for investors, shareholders, and service users. While the penalty to Scrushy in the $2.8 billion lawsuit was partially palliative for those who had lost everything, including faith in the medical industry, the fact that no criminal charges could be successfully leveled at him has left a bad taste in the mouths of many people for nearly a decade. When money that finds loopholes can buy innocence, then what's to stop more executives from manipulating the figures and dodging charges in the future? Reform is necessary, but scandal makers always seem to be one step ahead of the lawmakers. Chapter 7 Denny's The Racism Grand Slam at more than 1,600 locations around the world, patrons from more than a dozen countries are invited by Denny's to come in and enjoy the comfort, convenience, and affordability of an American breakfast. From its legendary Grand Slam breakfasts to its often 24-hour services, it has been a major restaurant chain since 1953, although its franchising operations didn't begin until 1963, when considerable growth and expansion of the brand began. However, in the 1990s, the popular diner spot came under serious fire for potentially discriminatory practices against minorities at many of their locations. The first incident that raised attention occurred in 1991, when a large group of black youths were asked to pay for their bills before they could be served. When the youth questioned the waitress about this unusual policy that was clearly only being instituted for them, the waitress replied that earlier there had been a group of African-American youths who had caused trouble in the restaurant and left without paying their bill. Therefore, the store management was requiring that black people had to pay for their meals up front. This blatantly discriminatory practice brought national attention on the small location in San Jose, California, and there was a public outcry for this racist behavior to be addressed. Denny's quickly covered their vulnerable racial points and worked closely with the NAACP to come up with tolerance schemes and racial sensitivity programs that could be disseminated to Denny's representatives, who could then establish appropriate practices in all locations. For two years, Denny's did its best to improve its image, even coming to an agreement with the original youths in question. However, less than a week after that agreement was signed in an attempt to salvage its public relations image, a second incident incited a new wave of anger when six black Secret Service agents were kept waiting and were refused service by a waitress in Annapolis, Maryland, in 1993. The white Secret Service agents present at the restaurant were seated and served. The timing of this second blatant case of racial discrimination essentially annulled the work that Denny's had been doing to save its image, and all of the pledges and commitments Denny's leadership had been making suddenly rang false in the ears of the country. Since the 1991 incident, thousands of other claims appeared, and as the list of complaints grew, it became clear that there had been systemic racism perpetrated and promoted in the higher management levels of Denny's. More than 4,000 complaints were eventually compiled against the breakfast chain giant. These ranged from other examples of black people being made to pay for their meals before they could be served, 
being made to pay more than white customers, suffering racial slurs from patrons and staff, or being refused service entirely. With thousands of independently proposed cases, this could no longer be considered as individual or random events. This was a company who had regularly engaged in discriminatory practices that had been disseminated from company leadership. The evidence was almost irrefutable, and the eventual total for that class action lawsuit was a whopping $54.4 million, paid out to more than 200,000 individuals and lawyers. It was the largest case and settlement based on an issue of race since the Civil Rights Act had made these sorts of discriminatory practices illegal. However, the story doesn't stop there. In 1994, despite the settlement, racial complaints continued, with six black women in Illinois claiming that they had been forced to wait for over an hour before they were served. Other diners, once again, had been seated, spoken to, and served before them. And when a waitress did approach them, she allegedly threw the menus at the patrons. In 1996, six Asian patrons of a Denny's in Syracuse, New York, were made to wait and were refused service, even as other white patrons were seated and served. They were then made to leave by security guards after complaining to the management. At this point, a group of white patrons of the restaurant followed them out of the establishment and beat them up. While the actions of those white patrons cannot be controlled by Denny's management, the continued reports of racist and discriminatory behavior in Denny's across the country could not be denied. Denny's underwent a second rehabilitation process that was even more intense than their original one. Every Denny's employee must now pass through racial sensitivity training. Denny's as a company also underwent massive changes. Only one franchise in 1993 was owned by a minority. Five years later, approximately 35% of franchises had minority owners. Denny's never denied its discriminatory practices had happened, only that they were in no way sanctioned or instructed by company management. They continued their image improvement strategy by making sizable donations to minority groups, and changed its hiring and marketing strategies to represent a more diverse and welcoming atmosphere for minorities. Not only did Denny's seek to make up for its gross errors in judgment and policy making, it sought to go above and beyond the norm in America and is now one of the most diverse companies in the country. The claim that the behavior of thousands of employees was not in some way inspired by managerial or corporate policy still seems far-fetched, even impossible. But the fact is, this scandal has made Denny's turn over a new leaf in a major way. In fact, in 2006 and 2007, Denny's was at the top of the list for Black Enterprises' best 40 companies for diversity. Saying that there is a silver lining to a shameful discrimination scandal may be controversial, but the public attention the issues attracted and the evolution of a major commercial chain from discriminatory or neutral on racial issues to a model of diversity and equality is almost inspiring. Perhaps that is the one good thing that came out of this Grand Slam scandal. Chapter 8. Madoff Investment Securities, LLC. Using Ponzi to Perfection. In what would become the largest accounting fraud and the largest Ponzi scheme in history, the story of Bernie Madoff's elaborate and unbelievable fraud scandal tops the charts in terms of blatant disregard for ethical behavior, accountability, the welfare of others, and simple decency. There remains an air of mystery and impossibility surrounding this particular scandal, as the sums discussed and the companies involved operate in some of the most exclusive, secretive, and elite levels of global society. While some of our other examples in this book have been smaller companies and smaller sums, the Madoff scandal was reported to have involved more than $64 billion in falsified sums and deceit spread out across Madoff's nearly 5,000 clients. Given the complexity of this case and the shockingly bold nature of the scam used to pull it off, a bit of context might be helpful. Bernard Madoff was a stockbroker, an investment advisor, for nearly five decades, from the founding of Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities, LLC, in 1960, until his empire's eventual collapse in 2008. The full extent of the fraud may never be known because Madoff implemented the most extensive and convoluted Ponzi schemes in history to achieve this massive fraud. Essentially, a Ponzi scheme is a pyramid scheme, based on covering losses from previous investors with the money from new investors. 
by promising modest and consistent returns for a select group of investors, Bernie Madoff was able to grow his modest investment firm into the sixth largest firm on Wall Street. He was managing the wealth of some of the richest individuals and companies in the world, ranging from transportation industry holdings to global charities. Interestingly enough, Madoff used seven feeder fronts that would acquire investors and funnel that money into the larger parent organization, leaving many people completely unaware that Madoff was in fact managing their money. As each successive group of investors demanded the return on their invested capital, Madoff would move the money from his next tier of investors up to cover his earlier debts. By operating in a very exclusive echelon of society in some of the most affluent areas of New York State, and using his Jewish heritage as a powerful tool of coercion, Madoff was able to manipulate tens of billions of dollars through his recycling cash scheme. Despite his ingenious plan, the global financial crisis hit Madoff just like the rest of the world, and it became nearly impossible to find new investors. As he was unable to cover his prior debts for the first time in decades, investors began requesting their money be withdrawn from the investment fund, likely to wait out the financial storm and keep their capital safe. However, most of that money didn't exist, or had been spent to cover other debts. European investors began to pull out in huge amounts, and the jig was essentially up. It wasn't long before the rest of the story came out, and the full scope of the deception was revealed. All $64 billion of it. The SEC had actually investigated Madoff's operations back in 1999, but they had failed to uncover the scheme, even though that had been Madoff's tactic for decades. While most scandals of this nature don't have a chance to ever grow to this size, purely based on whistleblowers and eventual suspicions, Madoff had covered himself in that department in a way that no one ever had. He hired his brother as the senior managing director and CCO, his niece as the compliance officer, and his two sons. Keeping this crime in the family allowed them all to benefit hugely from the fraud and there was a very low risk of exposure. Madoff's son admitted that they had all been aware of the fraud for years, and Madoff had explained the scheme many times. The revelations that came out in the years that followed showed the true face of greed and selfishness that runs rampant in the Wall Street world. The fact that a Ponzi scheme had been able to pervade the stock market to such an extreme degree shocked the world, and it sent ripples through global markets from Tokyo to South Africa. Due to the many companies and charities that had their money handled directly by Madoff, or through one of its feeder companies, many had to shut down across a wide berth of industries. Madoff set a new low for corruption and greed in the corporate and financial sector of America, and as such he received a landmark prison sentence for his offences. Madoff was sentenced to 150 years in prison, which was the maximum allowable. He had pleaded guilty to 11 federal crimes, mainly through his actions in creating, implementing, and reaping the benefits of the largest Ponzi scheme in history for nearly 50 years. There are dozens of things that could be learnt from the Madoff investment scandal, and this was only a very superficial summary of what occurred, but what this particular scheme revealed is that the corrupt actions of a single man can shake global markets and industries in a way that had not previously been seen. When the accumulated wealth of such an elite tier of investors and individuals is threatened, the ripples it can cause are enormous. Following the Madoff scandal, and as a direct result of those crimes, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, has instituted dozens of policy changes to keep this from ever happening again. The fragility of global markets has been brought into the spotlight in recent years making cases of this scale and severity a real danger to the financial security of thousands or even millions of people. Conclusion The Future of Corporate Scandal Early in this book we noted that trying to explain the underlying motivations behind such unbelievable greed and corruption is beyond the scope of this book, but perhaps we have provided some insight along the way. From some of the most trusted names in investing to real estate moguls and oil barons, scandals do not have any boundaries. Throughout history we have seen that power begets little more than a desire for more power, and when you are at the top of an industry there can be billions of dollars in low-hanging fruit to tempt executives. Not all the scandals we covered concerned massive amounts of money, nor were they limited to the investment or banking sectors. We can clearly see that corporate greed and corruption 
even in terms of philosophies, are shockingly common. Even a 150-year-old dynasty can't be safe, nor is a company dedicated to helping people rebuild their lives after traumatic events. The company's function and industry is obviously unimportant. Corruption, fraud, insider trading, intimidation, bigotry, and accounting malfeasance can occur anywhere to anyone. It only takes a few twisted minds and some misplaced numbers to begin the slow avalanche of fraud. Many of these scandals began small, and some of the perpetrators even admitted that when the illicit activities began, they were only intended to be a temporary fix to an identified problem. Despite those honourable intentions, fraud, deception, and corruption form a slippery slope, and just like the Ponzi scheme of Madoff, companies are continually covering their problems with more lies, using bigger shovels to dig their own graves. This book was intended to be both informative and cautionary. Small infractions may seem harmless, a necessary evil of the business world, but most great scandals begin with a single slip, but there's no telling how large and damaging they may eventually become. In terms of what we've learned about human nature, the only logical way to conclude is to reiterate what we said to begin this little journey through the dark side of corporate culture. Power and money corrupt, and absolute power and unlimited money corrupt absolutely. The problem is, as the markets continue to globalize and overlap, the temptation of billions will grow even further, just as greed for millions eventually swelled to billions. Global economies are powerful in themselves, but as a cumulative engine that drives our world, they represent one of the most important and essential elements of society. The actions of a corrupt few have nearly toppled stock markets and countries in the past. The fear, and it must be present to some degree, is that the next wave of creative accounting frauds, investment deceptions, and corporate corruption will not only be more clever, covert, and extensive, but far more damaging to the stability of entire nations and regions. Ongoing regulation and adaptation of global banking, financial, social, political and cultural policies is essential if we are to continue the arms race against corruption and greed. There will always be those who seek to take advantage and get ahead in the world. A similarly responsive and dynamic response must always be at the ready. The future depends on it 